Well, welcome to another episode of Planet Possible. We're delighted you're joining us to hear evidence-led discussion about topics that are critical to the way we manage our water and environment. A huge thanks to our season sponsor, Atkins Realis, and you'll hear a little bit more about them later. We're really grateful for their support in enabling us to bring the pod to you. If you're new to Planet Possible, I'm Nikki Roach. I'm a passionate advocate for all things water and environment and a fellow of SIWEM, the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management. And SIWEM members in over 90 countries are professionals with a breadth and depth of expertise in the topics that are shaping the future of our planet and will be joined by many of them across the rest of the season. So in today's episode, we're exploring coastal erosion and the management of our shorelines, with a specific focus on the Norfolk coastline here in England. North Norfolk and the East Riding of Yorkshire, both regions on the East Coast, have the highest rates of erosion in England and between them contain 84% of all the homes at risk of coastal erosion in the next 20 years. So we're going to discuss what happens when communities are at significant risk of coastal erosion, what support is available and how we manage our shorelines. And as ever, I'll pass my guest the planet possible magic wand. To help us navigate this topic, I am delighted to be joined by a wonderful co-host who has a wealth of experience in this space and who is the Director of Flood Risk Strategy and National Adaptation at the Environment Agency, the Environmental Regulator in England, Julie Foley. So welcome to Planet Possible, Julie. I am delighted that you're joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's get started by understanding the scale of the challenge. So how many people are affected by coastal change in England? So it's probably important to step back and just think about what our coastline looks like. So we've got 6,000 kilometres of open and dynamic coastline across England. And currently we've got 1.9 million people at risk of coastal flooding across England. We also know that climate scientists are telling us that we're going to have up to a metre of sea level rise at least by the end of the century. So we also know that some of the challenges facing communities with coastal flooding and storm surges are likely to become both more frequent as well as more severe. The other unique nature of our coastline, and you just mentioned it, is that we've got some of the fastest eroding coastlines in Europe, in this country, particularly in places like North Norfolk, which we're going to hear from in a moment, and East Riding. In those kind of locations, we can see up to maybe a metre, maybe two metres on average of erosion loss every year. And that's an average. So when you have really significant storms, like we just saw this winter, you have areas like Hemsby in North Norfolk that saw six metres of erosion loss, which is really phenomenal when you start to think about that, actually. And places like that with very, very sandy cliff faces, you know, have actually had lots of homes that have been lost in the last decade, up to 20, I believe, in the Hemsby area alone. So the challenges we're facing with both flooding and erosion are going to become more serious for us to manage as a, as a nation as we go forward in terms of climate resilience. Are there specific challenges within England that we're seeing beyond sea level rise? And is sea level rise kind of kicking in? Are we really seeing that happening yet or is that still to come, do you think? The main impacts, particularly for our shoreline, will be from coastal flooding and erosion. But of course, our coastline isn't detached from inland. And so when we have surface water flooding, groundwater flooding, that can have a cumulative effect in making the impact so much more worse. We actually saw that with Storm Kathleen in April of this year, when we had a lot of coastal flooding, is a lot of places were affected by a sort of culmination of flooding from a number of different sources, really, really impacting caravan parks and other communities. And that's partly why it was so challenging to deal with, actually, as well as being really therefore difficult to forecast when you have multiple impacts of flooding. That's a great introduction Julie, thank you and some really big numbers in there. So for our big interview today we're going to hear from Harry Blaithwaite. He is a councillor at the North Norfolk District Council. He's also the chair of Coastwise, Coastal Protection East and the Norfolk Coastal Forum. So let's hear from Harry. Welcome to Planet Possible Harry, it's lovely to have you with us. Well thank you very much for inviting me, I'm chuffed to heck. (laughs) that's brilliant let's get started by understanding a bit about the kind of norfolk coastline and some of the challenges that it's facing yeah the norfolk coastline if you think of north norfolk it goes from west to east not north to south on the west of north norfolk we have shingle banks and accreting salt marsh as the main protection to the far east we have the wall which is the hold line that is also backed up by sand dunes. But the sand dunes, the wall destroys the sand dunes in a way. And in between, we have the eroding coast, the eroding cliff, 
that is our biggest challenge. It's friable. It is prone to collapse. And ever since the Ice Age went away from us, we got this slowly eroding cliff line, which means a sinking beach. We just have to deal with that. And it's, it's a tricky one. And you talked about the wall. What is the wall? In 1953, in my ward, I actually live nearby. I don't actually live in my ward. In 1953, we had the big flood where the sea came in. And it obviously went across very, very low-lying land. None of my ward is basically above sea level. It had a devastating effect. The government of the day decided on that part to build a seawall to protect in the future. And it's worked brilliantly. So we've got shingle on one end, we've got the wall on the other and then the stretch in in the middle. And how long is that stretch of coastline? What are we talking about? That stretch of coastline is about 40 miles. Are we talking about a section of coastline that's quite populated, or what's it like? Yeah, it is. We have Cromer. We have Sheringham. Sheringham is shingle protection, seawall protection. But from there on, we start, the cliffs start building. From there, we have Cromer, which is a large community, and then various villages all along the way until we get to a place called Cart Gap. And at Cart Gap, the wall begins. So I am aware that obviously that part of the world is particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. What is the kind of future impact that you're expecting to experience? Well, it's not just the sea level rise. The impact we're getting is huge wet weather events which is leading to not surface water, but groundwater. That groundwater is eroding the cliffs faster than wave action, actually, at the moment. It depends where exactly along the cliff, because some of it is chalk, some of it isn't chalk, it's marl. But as sea levels rise, yes, it is going to be more and more wave action hitting the cliffs from below, and that will be accelerating the decline of the cliff slump from the top, from the groundwater erosion. And have you got lots of communities that are very close to the cliffs already, or are we talking about the quite a way back? Well, we have. Historically, we've got quite a few communities actually completely covered in sea as it is. So this is an ongoing process. I mean, most famously, we have a place called Haysborough, which is the most photogenic place with a lovely lighthouse, established housing that established housing as particularly a road called beach road imaginatively enough is going house by house recently we've been dealing with a place called trimmingham which is interesting it's that's a nice community that has been shrinking and, and last week we we had to demolish i don't know if you saw it in the papers we had to demolish a house that the cliffs it had eroded underneath it while the owner was away on holiday and came back to the understanding that his house was being demolished. Wow. So, But where we have the higher density housing, places like Munsley, we have a scheme going on at the moment, £24 million for Cromer and Munsley, where we're putting in granite rock armour to protect houses because the economics work. It's all about economics. The amount we're protecting stacks up to the amount the government is spending. We also have other communities that are equally prone but have been protected in the past but not, might not be protected so strongly in the future. I live in Yorkshire, nowhere near the sea, so I can't imagine that sense of I'm going to go on holiday and then my, I come home and my house is undermined. Tell us a little bit about, you know, you're a local councillor, you'll be really in touch with communities. How are communities responding to this? Haysborough is the case in point, is, is a good one, because with Haysborough, it's not quite big enough to attract government funding that will give it real protection so the community there is seeing itself being eroded and if you look at Haysborough there's a road called the coast road that road on the seaside are very active in save Haysborough when I knock on doors politically which I do in Haysborough 
the land side are not so activated. Their main threat, as they see it, is all the houses on the seaside are suddenly going to be transferred to the land side and they're going to lose their country views. They're going to get sea views instead, obviously. So everybody is very motivated by their own interests. But Haysborough is a case in point where the community has got together. They've got the Save Haysborough Society. None of this is fair. There isn't a fair thing about coastal erosion and the government's response to it. Yes, they can see Munsley being protected. Their houses are not being protected. And that's a hard thing to grasp. And then when somebody like myself comes along and says, well, you really are doing a wonderful thing because all this coast erosion produces loads of sediment and that sediment will go down the coast and it'll protect places like Great Yarmouth and South End and other places. So we, we can't stop the erosion because we need the sedimental transfer. But that's a hard sell for any politician. Mm. But then the next village to Haysborough is a place called Backton. And Backton has this massive gas plant. Basically, the whole of the southern half of the UK depends on Backton for its gas. Backton isn't a really big place. It doesn't have a huge population. But they are protected to the hilt because of the infrastructure. So as I say, nothing is fair. It's where you live and how the dice has fallen. So what is being done? I'm aware that there's the Coastal Transition Accelerator Programme, for example. So can you tell us a little bit about what is happening and what your strategic approach to managing that coastline is? Strategically, we have CoastWise, which Mm -hmm. is the Accelerator Programme, CTAP. That is to prepare for the worst. For instance, with the house we've just demolished at Trimmingham, the CTAP team, the, the CoastWise team went in We sorted out housing. We can sort out land further away from the coast that can be identified as possible building land for future. As the communities roll back, we will have the land available so they can roll back. It's all about preparing the communities for the future where it is not defensible. For instance, at Haysborough as a car park, understandably by the cliff edge is owned by the parish council. It has toilets, which are owned by the district council. It has a play area, great area for the tourism offer of Haysborough. But that is coming to a stage where it's no longer viable. We have helped the parish council by purchase the land in which to put the car park back. There is going to be a new car park set further back outside the coastline protection zone. That's an exercise and a practical exercise that CTAP has spent money, government money, in facilitating. And it is about facilitation. Are you working with communities at community scale to say, you know, previously we we may have been defending this coastline and now we're going to do managed realignment? If there was a community that was at risk, what does that look like from the CTAP programme? The Coastwise team been doing drop-in cafes. Community can come in, get a free cup of coffee. They can see the maps, the predictions. They can understand the challenges. The slow sell is we're not going to be saving your house, unfortunately, but we are making it so you can still have a house. You will still have a house. It might not be the perfect sea view you've got now, but it's all about... Spreading that word gently, but firmly. There's no point in pretending that every house, every holiday park, every car park, every pub, every village hall. I mean, at Trimmingham, the village hall has moved from one side of the road to the other side of the road. They've got a much better village hall, but the old village hall is still there because... The quirk of the game is, though we thought it was going, it hasn't gone. It's part of life, but you don't, communities don't get it, or individuals don't get it until they hear the crash of the wave and the suck of the wave retreating and taking the shingle and sand with it. And then they really get it and they know it's happening. And they're worried about how long they've got. And nobody can predict how long they've got because of the nature of the beast. 
but we can say, well, it's time you started thinking about it. What would work for you? We can do this. We've Earmark this piece of land. You can think about what you could build there. You could think about if your holiday park is no longer viable. This farmer has allowed this field. We will allow a holiday park there and all the facilities. And that way the story gets told in a way that everybody can take it. It's bite-sized pieces. It's a lot to take in, isn't it? Do, do you see whole communities moving in one go or is it is it quite piecemeal i have no sense of how that works it won't be a whole community we won't pick up haysborough and just take it inland i mean the graveyard is an interesting one at haysborough not as interesting as landfill sites you understand but we actually in north norfolk we haven't got a landfill site great Yarmouth right. have at risk that's really a dodgy problem but with graveyards when do we take the bodies from the graves and and start a new graveyard what do we do with the 15th century church what do we do with the pub which is grade two listed and is unique the victorians at trimmingham they actually took their church before it collapsed took it piece by piece and rebuilt it further inland it's kind of on the verge of being at risk again medieval churches are going to be a real challenge in norfolk we've got a lot of medieval churches and nobody wants to see a medieval church disappear over the cliff Mm. but it's those things deep within the community so if you move the church back communities in the past have have clustered around the pub and the church with the Mm. village hall that is the organic way of doing it. So how do you make those decisions? You know, if you have got a you know, 15th century church that is at risk of disappearing into the sea, is that, is that something you make as a decision with the community or how do those kind of decisions get made? It has to be with the community, but you have to lay out the fact that it's going to happen. Fortunately for North Norfolk, we've got a load of medieval churches You could say losing one, the diocese might be saving some money, but you have to take the community on board with it. You have to get acceptance. There isn't a silver wand. It's been going on for thousands of years. Our 2024 season of Planet Possible is supported by one of the leading engineering and design consultancies in the world, Atkins Realis. Here at Planet Possible, we bring a diverse range of voices from across the international water and environment sector to explore how to tackle some of the biggest challenges we face. And that aligns perfectly with the Atkins Realis purpose of engineering a better future for our planet and its people. We're really grateful to Atkins Realis for enabling us to bring another exciting year of Planet Possible to you. There has been a change in policy, hasn't there, between holding the line and then moving to manage realignment. So what are the lessons that you've learned around how to communicate that well to communities and how to help that message land in a way that is considerate, mindful, but also clear? There isn't an actual prescripted way that every community is the same. Just beyond North Norfolk is a community called Hemsby. Hemsby is washing away at the moment. That community is a community of people who have bought what used to be holiday chalets and made them homes in a precarious position. They will be from all over the country, possibly all over the world. And they have moved there relatively recently compared to, say, Haysborough, where there are people who have lived there all all their lives and their mothers have lived there and their fathers Mm. lived there and their grandparents are in the graveyard. So you cannot treat both communities the same. Hemsby, where people have bought into, they've invested, they've seen a way of life that they believe is their dream by the beach in a shed off-grid. And they're fighting tooth and nail. Because they won't accept it. Because mm. when they move from, for instance, I don't know where in Yorkshire you are, Harrogate, their dream was to live by the coast and live by the sea and have the beach just by them and the seagulls crying. They've bought into a dream. They're fighting tooth and nail. Whereas in another community where, as I say, it's long established, They're kind of more stoic and more accepting because they've seen it happen all their lives and they know it's coming, but it's accelerated. The difficult sell with those type of communities is the acceleration. 
the speed it suddenly decided to come at us because of mm -hmm. global warming. The lesson learned is you treat everybody individually and then as a community, and then you find out exactly what they will find acceptable and provide what they will consider acceptable for them and for their lives. Mm -hmm. And they should have the best possible lives they can have given the circumstances. I guess it's how you'd want to be treated if, if you were in that situation, isn't it? Really be heard and try and find a way through, but accepting the brutal facts that, you know, the situation needs to potentially change. OK, Harry, so final question. And I ask all our guests this. So I'm going to pass you the Planet Possible magic wand. Give it a wave. What would you like to make possible? I would like to make possible insurance for properties in peril from the sea. There is a wonderful scheme called Flood Re for houses that are insured against flood, but there's no such thing for houses to be insured against coastal erosion, even coastal flood. Once we have insurance, it will make all the difference and it will change the conversation because they know they will be able, should the worst happen, to start again with at least mm. something in the bank. And I'd be really, really happy to see that. That's absolutely fascinating. I hadn't appreciated it didn't exist. So that's a great one to end on. Harry, thank you so much for joining us on Planet Possible. It's been a real pleasure. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. So, Julie, what are your initial reflections on the interview with Harry? It's really great to hear a local elected member being really visible and open and, and indeed brave in talking about the realities of coastal erosion and the coastal challenges that we're facing. And in places like North Norfolk, those coastal erosion challenges are very real for communities. So sometimes when we talk about climate adaptation, that can feel very far away to many people. But actually the challenges facing communities in different bits of North Norfolk are, are really here and now. And we are confronted by the realities of needing to look at rolling communities back and moving them away and transitioning them back from the coastline. And I think he described that really, really well, as well as the really important engagement that the council is doing in involving and ensuring that there's buy-in from local people and businesses. He talked a lot about fairness. I was really struck by that. And he referenced the Environment Agency's position moving in some areas from hold the line, protecting those areas, to manage realignment, which I guess is allowing the coastline in some areas to erode. Talk to us about how the Environment Agency plans how to manage coastlines. This is where I'd like, really like to talk about shoreline management plans and what those are. Many people won't have heard of a shoreline management plan, but actually they're really brilliant in that they're world leading approaches to coastal adaptation. Unlike many other countries around the world, we have shoreline management plans covering all aspects of our coastline. Indeed, we've got 20 of them and they're comprehensive plans that look at planning for coastal adaptation, not just for the next few years, but over the decades heading out to the end of the century and beyond. They're unique in that what they do is they set out a number of different approaches. And you can think about those in sort of three broad categories. So the first is around holding the line. That's where we take action to, broadly speaking, keep the coastline more or less where it is by helping to protect, maintain and defend existing sea defences. The second category is called manage realignment. And that's where we work with nature, in many cases, to realign the shoreline through the creation of intertidal habitat, wetlands and salt marshes, and they act as a, as a natural buffer to storm surges and wave action. And in selected places, it can involve what's called no active intervention. What we mean by that is we need to let nature take its course. And there are some parts of the country where the scale and the pace of climate change is now so significant that in the longer term, it's not going to be either technically or economically feasible to be able to protect that coastline. And some of the locations that Councillor Blaithwaite referred to are no active intervention locations, so places like Hemsby. But he also referred to other bits of the coastline where we're going to be able to take, where we've been taking quite innovative approaches to sandscaping and providing defences such as in Bacton. So when you look at different bits of our coastline, what the Shoreline Management Plan does is it says what's the best sustainable management approach for that particular part of the coastline over the decades to come. And it reflects the sort of geology 
of those different places as well. So where you've got really sandy, fast eroding cliffs versus sable ch- chalky cliffs. So it needs to reflect the realities of the fact that the coastline is, is very, very different, even in one specific location like North Norfolk. I want to ask you about those plans in a bit more detail, but I'm particularly interested in a word you just used that I've never heard before. What is sandscaping? Councillor Bayfoy described this brilliantly, actually. It's a really innovative concept. It's based on a sort of Dutch concept where a huge amount of sand is brought onto a coastline. In the case of Bacton, it's been a phenomenal amount of sand brought onto that coastline. It reinforces the beach landscape so that it can provide a defence to wave action and storm surges. And what it helps to do in locations where there are significant challenges around coast flooding is it helps to buy time, because without that reinforcement of a significant amount of sand and beach management, then the impacts of that you know, severe storm surges would be directly impacting communities and impacting them now today. So what it does is it buys time for adaptation and for communities to get prepared in the longer term for potential transition. So you've talked about shoreline management plans. Are they dynamic documents? Are they, you do them once every 50 years? Tell me a little bit about how they work and how accessible they are really. Yeah, so shoreline management plans are living plans. So the idea is they don't stand still in time. They're constantly being updated. The really important part of them is not just what they say, but how they get put together. So shoreline management plans are put together and led by what's called coastal groups around the country. There are seven coastal groups around England, and those coastal groups are made up of members of the local authorities on the coast, the Environment Agency, other statutory bodies like MMO and Natural England, as well as local infrastructure providers and businesses. And the idea is that those coastal groups collaborate and work in partnership to agree the best sustainable management approaches for that coastline. And they do that using the best available evidence, the best climate science, the best regional monitoring information that we help to provide as the Environment Agency with our partners. Shoreline management plans aren't something that's imposed by the Environment Agency. We work with coastal groups and coastal authorities to produce them. They are collaborative understanding. And that's important because they need to have they need to inform our investment choices, but they also need to help steer local planning decisions as well in a a geography as well, where we need to avoid inappropriate development in in high areas at risk of flooding or or erosion. So I was particularly interested to hear that homes that are at risk of erosion have got quite limited financial support and and lack access to insurance and Harry mentioned Flood Re which for listeners that might not be aware is a UK government backed insurance scheme that supports properties at risk of flooding and and in essence insurers that offer home insurance pay into the Flood Re scheme and that raises a levy that's then used to cover those homes. So Harry said he would love to see a coastal erosion insurance scheme. What are your reflections on that Julie? I completely understand why because Flood Re has been hugely successful in enabling access to affordable flood insurance and giving people options to build that better in inland areas. And we have no equivalent for the coast. I think the really challenging concept here is that when you're talking about insurance, for the insurance sector, it's probably going to be very difficult to persuade the insurance sector to provide insurance to homes and businesses that are at erosion risk and who have properties that in future years, sadly, won't necessarily be there. They will be affected by an eroding coastline. They're likely to be lost to the sea. In other countries around Europe, what we're aware of is that governments provide compensation. That's not a mechanism that exists in this country, I should add, to provide compensation for people affected, because, you know, quite understandably, if your property is at risk, and that is your only home building business, the idea that it might be lost to the sea and you have no entitlements around that, no financial comeback or insurance is really, really difficult. And it's also equally difficult for the local authorities as well, because they also don't have funding generally provided to be able to invest in rolling back communities and finding alternative places for people to relocate. And that's the very reason why we set up the Coastal Transition Accelerator Programme was because actually of that absence of funding and mechanisms to be able to support communities in the right way, to be able to transition and adapt, because there just aren't mechanisms around insurance for the coastal sector or indeed compensation. 
I mean, Harry talked about the Coastal Transition Accelerator Programme and it's called Coastwise, isn't it? I think locally in North Norfolk. I hadn't heard about it before Harry and I talked. Tell us a little bit more about that CTAP programme and, and what it's doing nationally and kind of what your aspirations for it are. We worked really hard in the 2020 budget to secure some funding for CTAP. So it was the same time that we secured our investments for our overall flood and coastal investment programmes, the majority of the money of which goes in traditional sea hard engineered defences and beach management schemes. And there is no, that up until that point, there was no way of funding coastal transition or coastal adaptation. So we created this concept of the Coastal Transition Accelerator Programme And we started with two locations, actually. You've heard from Councillor Brayfay's work with the council in North Norfolk, uh, which is called Coastwise. The other key project is in East Riding, which is called Changing Coasts. It goes under that banner, uh, because East Riding also has major challenges around coastal erosion and landslips. What we wanted to do is provide some funding to be able to look at how we can roll back communities, relocate you know, central community facilities, whether or not that's car parks on the coast, cafes, beach huts. We also wanted to look at opportunities to create coastal zones that provide nature-based adaptation and buffers to storm action and wave action to help, as I said, buy time. And we also wanted to provide the funding to be able to look at innovative finance. So how do we kind of fund coastal adaptation into the future when the funding for this time-limited programme ends? What happens after that? How can some of these places be more self-sufficient with their funding into the future? And those two areas have received £15 million, which enables them to actually do some very, very proactive community engagement like we've been hearing about in North Norfolk. And at the end of last year, we extended CTAP to a number of smaller locations in the southwest. So that includes Bude in Cornwall and Swanage and Charmouth in Dorset as well. So we'll be taking forward CTAP in a number of smaller locations as well. And the idea is that we get all this learning from this innovation programme and that helps to inform our future investment bids to government so that we can mainstream some of this work, recognising that the erosion challenges that these communities are facing, which are quite unique and here and now at the moment, but we know that there's likely to be you know, thousands of other properties around the coastline impacted by erosion in decades to come and so they're also going to need to have support around coastal transition as well. So you've talked really articulately there about the future position that might be to come and and CTAP feels like the seeds that you're sowing for more. What do we need to be doing by 2050 that we're not doing now when it comes to coastal management? Here and now we've got hundreds of properties at risk of erosion around England And with a changing coastline and sea level rise, we're likely to have thousands of properties at risk of erosion. But the best way in which we understand that is through building our evidence base. One of the things we're doing as the Environment Agency, and we do this under the banner of what's called our strategic overview role of all sources of flooding and coastal change, which includes erosion, is we produce great evidence that provides an understanding about current risk as well as future risk. And we've got two key tools in train at the moment for seeking to do that. The first is called the National Assessment of Flood Risk, what's also called NAFRA. And that exists at the moment, but it's been updated to reflect local modelling and national modelling in terms of risk and to build in climate change. And that will update our understanding of future coastal flood risk. And then we've got another tool, which is the National Coastal Erosion Risk Maps, which are also called ENSERM, and they will update our understanding, again building in climate change and the latest regional monitoring information. That will update our understanding of homes and properties and infrastructure at risk of erosion over the next century. And that information will then provide key evidence to be able to inform practitioners and policy makers about the investments they make, as well as spatial planning choices. What's brilliant about those two tools NAFRA and ENSERM is that they will enable us to collectively paint a picture of what our kind of wet and disappearing coastline is going to look like in the decades to come. And we'll have those tools available towards the end of the year. So it's actually quite a pivotal moment 
in terms of updating our understanding of coastal flood risk and erosion. And then we'll use that evidence to be able to continue to update our living plans, our shoreline management plans, and make those as accessible and visible as possible to both practitioners and communities. So those tools will be available to the public. Can anybody be able to go and go online or go somewhere and have a look at those plans and understand what the future looks like? Is that the intention? Yes, we'll be we'll be looking to make those information available through things like check your long term flood risk, which is already on gov.uk. So we'll be updating that. Also, importantly, for the shoreline management plans, we've recently sought to make those much more accessible and map based. So earlier this year, we put all the refreshed shoreline management plans that we've been working so hard with coastal groups on, on a new digital tool called Shoreline Management Plan Explorer. And it means that anybody can put their postcode in, search their bit of the coastline and find out what is the sustainable management action for that bit of the coastline, not just today, but into the future. And we'll be using things like the new erosion risk maps to update the shoreline management plan. So we continue to make that information as transparent and visible as possible. So it's really important that if people are going to be empowered to constructively challenge, if you like, both their local elected members and national governments of the future, that they have the best available information. So we don't want things like shoreline management plans to be sort of sitting on the shelf. We want them to be readily available so that everybody can use them and make informed choices about what coastal change looks like for them in their local places. That's brilliant. Well, we'll put a link in the show notes to the site in that case then so people can go and have a look at their own if they want to. That's brilliant. Thank you. OK, final question. And you probably know what's coming because I ask all my guests this. I'm going to pass you the Planet Possible Magic Wand, Julie. Give it a wave. You can make anything possible. What would you want? I would love the shoreline management plans to be statutory plans. So having spent so much time working coastal groups to update them and to make them brilliant plans in terms of living coastal change adaptation plans, it always surprises me that they're not statutory plans. And if they were to be made statutory, that means that they would be made more material in planning choices. We'd be able to ensure that we're not getting any new developments along our coastline in areas at high erosion risk or where there's coastal flooding risks. And that's really, really important, actually, is to tie the shoreline management plans much more and hardwire them into spatial planning and town and country planning. So um, I'd love to see that because when you look at parts of our coastline currently and you just take a map and have a look at it, you know, you don't just see homes at risk. You've got railways close to the coastline. You've got other critical infrastructure, power plants, water treatment plants. We need to be really wary and thoughtful about further development in areas at risk And the shoreline management plans should be informing that. And if they were made statutory, I think that would really help to give them status and to ensure that they can remain fit for the future. Brilliant. Great answer. And uh, well, you heard it here first. Statutory shoreline management plans. I think that's a a really positive way forward. Thank you. Julie, I have learned so much through this episode. I've absolutely loved making it. Thank you so much for joining us. As ever, time has flown by and we're here at the end of another episode of Planet Possible. So thank you for joining us too. I hope you found the conversation insightful. Hopefully it's given you something to think about in your world. You can subscribe to Planet Possible on your usual podcast player to never miss an episode. And we'd love as ever to hear your ratings and reviews. We've got more fantastic guests and topics lined up for the rest of the year so I hope you'll keep joining us and all that leaves me to say is a huge thank you to my superb guest councillor Harry Blaithwaite and my excellent co-host Julie Foley that's it everyone stay safe and we'll see you next time